to the cloud. Okay. Okay. <laughs> cool. So uh, hi guys. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. I'm Kenneth, a year three CS student. This is Yuan, uh, year one. We are both part of the NUS GDG, NUS Game Development Group, uh, part of the EXCO. So thank you so much for joining us today to learn about game development. Uh, today Yuan will be giving a workshop on the beginners of the beginning stuff of Unity and trying to cram a three-week course into two hours. So during the course, if you have any questions, uh. Feel free to ask me because you'll be doing the presentation. So I'll just be walking around helping you and assisting you as Unity is very hard for beginner level. So uh, without further ado, please keep your hands together and actually wait, no. No. There's one more side. Yes. Yes. So who are we? Any of GG. So uh, who has heard of us? Why you never come for a CTA? <laughs> okay. So uh, I'll do the channel group. The, if you want to join our CTA, it's literally no barrier to experience. It's, it's the left of the room. No, but you see, uh, it's even like, oh, oh, it's so on. No, then you just turn off again. So yeah, uh, if you want, uh, we have Telegram group as well as the Discord, just find out all, all the links can be available on NUS thing, so just go search it after. And without further ado, the workshop will start now. If you have any questions, please raise your hand on top. Okay. So, hello everyone. I think uh, Kenneth did a good job introducing, so I'm not going to talk about anything. So let's just start the workshop. So let's, before we start, let's do a quick vibe check. Okay. Anyone here has never played games before? <laughs> okay, I see everyone has played games, okay? Everyone here does not have coding experience. All right, everyone's a coder here, I see. Now, Anyone here has actually used Unity before? Raise your hand. Okay, good. So this workshop is for all of you, okay? So let's get started. So the, to introduce you to game development, the first step you need to make a game is a game engine. So a game engine is just a tool like VS Code, but you make games with it. Right. So it provides a ready to use environment. So you can just focus on design and trying to figure out what the technical details of the physics should do, the physics of the game should do, right? So you can just focus on designing the game rather than trying to figure out what are the mathematical equations behind some kind of kinematics bullshit in physics are. Okay. And it also provides cross platform support. So as you can see in Unity, you have you can create all sorts of different games for all sorts of different platforms, right? You can create, you can use a game engine to create for Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo Switch, any kind of device that can run games out there, you can easily create for them uh, through a game engine. And the most important part is if you use a commercial, commercially available game engine, you can use Stack Overflow, right? Anyone here not heard of Stack Overflow? Surely you have, okay. And the most, the three of the most popular choices of game engines that are available out there uh, is Unity. This is what we're gonna be learning today. There's Unreal Engine that is more advanced and looks more realistic. And there's Godot that's very similar to Unity, but is uh, slightly different in its own way. So why should we learn Unity? First of all, it's free. So you can just kickstart your game development pro, like your dream of making your dream game, right? For free. It has a free license that you can use and you can just do everything with it, okay? It's quite easy to learn. I wouldn't say it's very beginner friendly, but it is easy to learn because you code in C Sharp, which is synthetically similar to Java. And it has quite a sophisticated interface that allows you to create all the different kinds of things that you want for your game. And there are also a bunch of tools that are built in to the engine itself. So you can just really just do what you want as long as you know how to use it, right? It's cross-platform. So as I mentioned, you can publish, you can just make your game on your PC and you can publish it on an Android device or an iOS device. And you can just play on your phone on the go. So that's literally only one device you need to make the game, and that's your PC. It has a large asset store. 
we're going to dive into this uh, later down in the workshop. But essentially, it's like a marketplace that you can get a bunch of stuff that is available for Unity. Libraries, uh, art packs, sound packs, and all those kinds of things, right? And there's an active community. It's like Stack Overflow, but it's called Unity Forums. So you can ask your questions there. Or if you have any questions during your own development process, you can just put to Google. And there's going to be like a forums unity coming out because the questions that you ask, most likely someone else has asked before. And you can just use it like Stack Overflow and just get your answers there. And it also provides us just the bare bone framework for creativity. So once we get into the interface, you can see that there's literally nothing. Okay, but so that you can do everything that you want. Okay, you can make a game that has different art styles from others. You can make a game that just plays differently from others. Be creative. Okay, that's the point of using Unity. So, but what can you make with Unity? So let's just take a few examples that we have uh, for ongoing popular games that was made with Unity. We have our childhood memory, Angry Birds. Who the original one is not on Unity. We have an AR game like Pokemon Go. You can go out to well, world. Anyone here never played Pokemon Go before? Surely you have. There's uh, puzzle games like Monument Valley 2. Okay. There are party games like Among Us and uh, Fall Guys. We have survival games like Rust. Uh, adventure games like Subnautica. Uh, shooter games like Call of Duty Mobile. And there's also VR games like Beat Saber. And of course, you can make like very, very advanced, highly technical games like uh, City Skylines, a simulation game. You know, that's uh, Escape from Tarkov, a hardcore first person shooter game. And uh, Genshin Impact. Okay, the hit game of 2020, right? Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. So allow me to sit down. So our goal today is to make a simple 2D platformer game that is very easy to do. We can do this in two hours, I think. So the first thing you need is Unity. Has anyone not downloaded the Unity engine yet? Okay, good. So once you are in Unity, you want to click on new project. And here you see a bunch of things. Okay, you can make a bunch of stuff. There are already available templates for you for mobile games, you know, and some learning ones, but we don't need that. We're going to make a game from scratch so you can get to the basics of it. So we're just going to create a 2D game. You can choose your editor version here if you have multiple engine versions. Okay, then you can just give a name, whatever name you want. Okay, you can just call this like beginners or hello world or something, and you can change the location. Okay, now you can just click on click, uh, start pro uh, create project, but that's going to take a couple of minutes. So I've already created one beforehand. So over here, we have the very bare bone interface for Unity. So when you are creating the project, that's going to take a couple of minutes to do. I'm just going to run through what the UI is and how it is. Okay, so over here, on this left panel here, can everyone see my cursor? Right. So over here, we have the hierarchy. So here is all the game objects that you put into your game scene. So say you have a player, it's going to be here. You're going to see here. Okay. So right now, there's literally nothing. There's only a camera in this scene. Okay. So you can only see like just a camera here. And that's all there is when you start a new Unity game project. <clears throat> so over here, there's the scene editor that you can edit uh, all, all kinds of, uh, how you want the scene to look like. Okay, you can edit it there. There's the game screen that you can pull around. Normally I like to put it here. So this one is how the game would look like. So you have a preview and you can also play your in-development game here. We're going to go through that later. So you can change the aspect ratio of it. Generally, you want to just set it to 16 by 9 so it doesn't mess things up. You can change the scale of it and stuff like that. So over here, that's the inspector. 
if you select any kind of game object, all its available properties will be here. And you can change the component, you can add stuff, you can change all these kinds of properties that's over here. Okay, we're gonna go more in depth into this later. Over here, you have the project. These are all the assets that you have in the game. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, right now there's nothing. There's only a scene. And the scene is like a game level. So anything that you want to build in Unity that looks different from that looks different from what is here, you probably want to use a new scene. So you can just try to keep things simple. Each scene is a thing, each scene is a game level and stuff like that. And aside from that, that is just it. That's the console that Unity has decided to throw a random error that is normal. You will see a lot of Unity errors in the process. So here you can try to debug stuff uh, or you know just look at all these kinds of errors and try to figure out what's wrong. Okay, so when we first start off, you need to have an idea of what you want to do. We're doing a platformer game today. So does anyone have any idea what should we have in a platformer game? Yes, anyone? A ground, yes, we need a ground. What else? Obstacles, correct, and? We can start this off by first creating a player. So you can right click on this game object hierarchy here and you can just create a 2D object, a sprite. A sprite is like an art file, okay? Unity provides us like very simple ones like a square and a circle, okay? We're just gonna use a circle for the player. So once you create it, you see that there's a name here that is highlighted. You can just change it to player. So you know that this is a player, okay? When you have a bunch of stuff in there, you'll probably wanna know which one is your player. So once you have a player, we also need a ground for starters. So we're just going to create a square. We're gonna call that a ground. And notice it's overlapped with my player. So you, I wanna move it. I can use one of these tools called the move tool to move it around. So you can move up and down anywhere you want. There's also the left and right for fine tune. But it's too small to be called as a ground. Like if you've played Super Mario before, you know that the ground is long, it's rectangular at least. So you want to change the size of it. You can use the scale tool to change it like this, or you can use one of this rec tool to change it like this. Right, so normally you'd use the scale tools because it scales from the middle to the side. So you push it, you pull it, it goes to both sides. So now you have a ground. Surely this game will work at this point. So let's give it a play. And, uh, oh, it's floating. That's not supposed to happen. So the thing about Unity is you need to let it know that these objects would have to be affected by physics. So we know that the player should probably be affected by gravity and fall down, right? So, in order to do that, we're going to need to use a rigid body 2D component. So, game objects with a rigid, 2D, rigid body 2D component will simulate in-game physics. For example, mass, it will have mass, it will have gravity, it will have drag, it will have velocity, all those kinds of physics stuff. And then it is also affected by force and collision with other game objects that has rigid body 2D component. Okay, so we can add that by just clicking on this add component button here on the inspector, you select player. And over on the inspector, you can click on add component and just search for rigid body 2D. Then you'll probably want to do the same for the ground because of course the ground is a physics object as well. So you want to do that as well. And now that I've added that, this should work, right? Okay, it both fell. That is not what we wanted to do. So the reason why the ground also fall 
is because it is a dynamic rigid body. So a dynamic rigid body is affected by all kinds of force as well as gravity. We don't want the ground to experience gravity. That's counterintuitive, right? It's not like the ground is falling downwards right now. So we're going to use either a kinematic or a static rigid body, depending on how you like it. So what are the differences? They're essentially almost the same thing, but there are a couple of key points that are different. A kinematic rigid body is not affected by force or gravity. It can move through velocity. So you can change the velocity component of the kinematic rigid body so that it can move left, right, or up, down. You can also move by changing its position. And it has infinite mass because it is not affected by force. So by physics, it has infinite mass. A static rigid body, on the other hand, is not only not affected by force and gravity, it is completely immovable. So you cannot move a static rigid body by giving it velocity or changing its position. It will never move. And it also has infinite mass. For the purpose of this uh, workshop, we're just going to focus on using a static rigid body because it has the less performance costs as well as we don't need to move the ground. Okay, so let's give it a play. Surely this will work now. And yeah, that did not work. So why does it not work? You need a, sorry. Why does it not work? Because you need a collider. A collider is essentially a component that allows uh, objects to collide into each other. If you do not give it a collider, the game engine does not know that you want these two objects to collide. So if you have played any kind of games out there and you'll be like, why is this hitbox so annoying? That is collider. So you want to make sure that the engine knows that this object and this object should collide with each other. So how we would do that is just by adding a collider. This is a player. The player is a circle. So we can just add a circle collider 2D. And we don't have to change anything. Unity would automatically adjust it to the size. And for the ground, we can see that this is rectangular. So we can just add a box collider 2D. So at this point, we have a very bare bone game. Okay, the physics works as intended. The player will stay on the ground. The ground doesn't fall and that's all we need, right? But we're still missing something. What is that thing? Can anyone take a guess? What makes this not a game? Controls, yes. So you need to have a way to control the object. So in order to control your player, you need to start writing code, okay? So you need to first, for uh, best practice purposes, you want to create a new folder called scripts under the assets folder, the main asset folder. Open that up. Now you can right click and create a c -sharp script. So we're just going to call this c -sharp script player movement because all you do, all it does is it's just going to control the movement of the player. Now you can double click on it and it will, it should open up your favorite IDE. Okay, it can be VS Code, it can be Vim. Actually, I don't think Vim works here, but uh, my personal favorite for Unity is Visual Studio because it's um, it looks much more professional. Okay, so now that you have it here, what are the key points for us to make an object move? Is there like some kind of properties that we need it to have? I think I hear something. Input. Okay, we are going to need an input. But before we need an input, we also need the player to have a speed. It's not like we can let it run as fast as light. Right. So we need to give it a speed. So we first need to declare a private variable, a private float variable called speed. 
Now here's a pop quiz. Why do we use float? Why is it not integer? Why is it not double? Why do we use float? Does anyone have an idea? Integer overflow. Mm, that's not quite it. Because integer has like, what, 2.17 million available values to positive and negative. So that's not quite that. Any other wild guesses? Um, anyone took CS2100? Yes, no. There's a difference, right? Okay, so we use float over integer because we probably want to do decimal places. Can we do decimal places in integer? No, because integer is a whole number. So if you want to do something like 2.1 for the speed, we're going to need to use a float. Does that make sense? But double also serves the same purpose. Why don't we use double? Any wild guesses? Too much space, correct. So a float or a floating point 32, FT32, is preferred in game development because it takes up less memory. It's only 32 bits compared to doubles uh, 64 bits. So less space or less bits used means faster to calculate. Intuitively speaking, it's like making, so for example, if you do like a two digit edit addition, it's gonna be faster than you doing a 10 digit addition. So it's the same thing for computers as, is, as it is for human brains, okay? And the thing is, float is already precise enough for general purpose calculations. We don't need it to be as precise as doubles, like absolutely small rounding error when calculating the distance between Earth to Pluto. We don't need that. It's not like moving an extra millimeter in a game would actually affect any kind of feeling for you. So we only use a float here. And most importantly, a lot of libraries on Unity are built on float. So you can have quick access to those libraries in the future when you want to move down game development. So we're just gonna do a private float here. But you're probably asking yourself, do I have to open this code editor every single time I want to change the value? You probably don't want to do that, right? So you want to have an I you want to have a way to change this value inside of the editor such that you can kind of like you know fine-tune the values if you feel like the feeling isn't correct. So for that, we can add a serialized field in front of this variable. So in short, what this does is this allows this uh, variable, this field to be available for edit in the inspector. So for example, in order to use this script, we first need to attach this to the player. So you can just open up the player and drag and drop this script to the add component part. It's gonna open it up and you can see we have a speed view here. So you can change this here, and this is going to change it for the player. So you can just tune the value here, whatever you want, but we're not going to do that for now. So we want to make this move. We need to have an input. And in order for this to have an input, we are going to declare a new field called horizontal move. So we're going to touch on this later when I implement it. So we just keep it there first. So when we start, uh, as, as well as we need to be able to take the rigid body component, because how else are we going to make the player move? We need to change its velocity, right? So in order to change the velocity of the game object, we need to get its rigid body component. So we're just going to declare another field, which is of type rigid body 2D. It's the same thing that you have added there. So essentially here we have start and update. What do they do? So start is called once before the first frame of for the game object. So when the game object spawns, it's going to call start. And update 
is going to be called every single frame. Like if the game runs on 60 frames per second, update is going to be called 60 times every second. So that's essentially what's going on. So for start, we first need to instant, we first need to get the component of the rigid body 2D component. This allows us to use this RB variable to refer to the rigid body 2D component of the object that this script is attached to. So this script will be attached to player and therefore RB would be assigned, uh, sorry, the rigid body 2D component of the player will be assigned to this variable RB. So you can just change that. So we need to have an input and we can do that for every single frame. So every single frame we, we need to know if we are going to the left or going to the right, right? So we're just gonna do horizontal move equals input. So input is a class that Unity provides for us, for developers to just take the input of the keyboard, take the input of the mouse. So if you do input or get axis raw, this means that it's going to get the raw axis. So if you take in horizontal, this will take in the value between zero, between negative one to one. So if you go to the left by convention, the value will be negative one. If you go to the right by convention, the value will be positive one. Okay. So how do we know what keys are assigned to it? It's actually in here in Unity. If you click on edit project settings, you see an input manager here. And if you click on axis, that's the name of the axis, which is horizontal. And we can see that that's the negative button set to left, set to right for the positive, as well as an alternate negative button to A and D. So that's the, I mean, everyone use WASD right now. So that's there. So now that we have that, we, we still need to assign a speed to it. Now we can take in an input, but we still need to make the object move. So what you can do is we just change the velocity component, RB the velocity, and this velocity is a vector two component. So we just need to create a new vector two, which is equals to speed, this speed here, times the horizontal move, which is the direction of the object. So if you click A, it's gonna, if you press A, it's gonna go to the left. If you press D, it's gonna go to the right. And we're still going to give it a Y component. We're just gonna keep this as the same because we probably don't want this to change the momentum when you're jumping. Okay, we are gonna implement jump later. So now that we have that, let's do a play. And uh, oh, it's not moving. Oh, because I did not give it a speed. So let's just give it some arbitrary value like six. Okay, you can change the value yourself. And now I press A and D, you can see that it's moving. Cool. But something's still missing. We can't jump. We need to jump. Who plays Super Mario without jumping? Right, so you need a way to jump. So how do we jump? We jump when we press a button. So this can just be a simple conditional statement, right? So if input dot get button and the button name, just jump, get button jump, we just jump, but as usual, we're going to need a reference to the jump value. So how high are we going to jump or how fast are we jumping up? So we can just do this same thing, but we call this jump speed. 
so then you can see that this is going to pop up here and we can give it a value. Let's say we give it four. So we jump, so we jump four, right? So when we jump, we just want to change the Y component of the velocity. So this is just the same thing. Is equals to a new vector two component, which is we keep the X velocity because we don't want to lose momentum when we jump. We want to be able to bunny hop, right? So we don't want to lose momentum when we jump. So we just keep the X component. But for the Y component, we're just going to say it's going to be jump speed. It's positive, so we jump upwards. So let's try this out. I press space and I jump. And I can move left and right. But that's a problem. When I try to bunny hop, Oh, I fly up. How do we solve this? So in order to solve this, we will have to use a built-in Unity tool called a layer mask. So this allows us to separate one object from another. So if you have like this table mask as a table, if I touch it, I know it's a table, right? Unity allows us to create a physics interaction abstraction for objects. So we can use physics, so you can separate things uh, from each other. So we know that the table is a table, the ground is a ground, the sky is the sky, the river is the river. To do that in Unity, you need to use a layer mask. So how do we use that? Well, you just need to click on the ground. We want to separate the ground from whatever else so that we can check that whether or not we're on the ground. If not, Unity doesn't know. Like, why is the ground? Why is the ground? I don't know what's a ground. So you need to make Unity know that this is a ground so that we can let the player know that it's on the ground. Does that make sense? Yep. okay. So over here, when you click on the ground, that's the inspector. There's a layer here that you can change. And we're just going to add a new layer. Over here, you can add like 31 layers. That's not important. We're just going to add one. That's called the ground. We're just going to call it ground. Now you can go back and you can select ground as the layer. So now that you have a layer, Unity will be able to tell that this object is on the ground. But we still need to add a few interfaces to it. So in order to do that, First, we need to check if the player is on the ground. So we're just going to do a private new void function called is ground, is ground. Sorry, in C sharp, it should be capital case. So when we are on the ground, this, sorry, this, this Boolean function should return true when we're on the ground. When we are not on the ground, it should return false. And this is how we can check whether or not the player is on the ground. So how do we do that? Well, that the reason why we use a layer mask is because we can just return it. So we can just call the physics2d interface, physics2d.overlap circle. So over here, you can take a point but we don't have a point yet. So in order to have a point, we probably need to know which location, like at which place is the player standing on. Like the player needs to have a feet or something. It has to have a reference point that we know that if this thing touches the ground, we are on the ground. So in order to do that, we're gonna go to the player and we're gonna right click and create an empty. So this empty would be called the ground check. So this is the point on the player where when it touches the ground, it will be on the ground. We know that it's on the ground. So by doing that, you want to select it and you wanna move it. So where's the ground? It's over here, right? 
it has to be down here. So we can move it to this point of the circle such that this point, when this point touches the ground, we know that the player is on the ground. So you can just move it with this move tool over here. You can see that the point where they kind of intersect is where the empty object is. There's nothing there. So now that we have a ground check, we still need to refer to this in the script. So we want to add an additional field. This field would be a private field, a private transform field called um, ground check. So a transform class contains all the positional and rotational information for the game object. So at which position does this game object, like where is this game object in the position vector of the game object? So if this game object is on x0, y0, it's going to be safe to this transform class of this game object. So once we have this transform, we have the positional information of where the ground check object is supposed to be. All right. Now, aside from that, we also need to know what layer is the ground. So we're just going to do the same, but we're going to call a layer mask type. Remember that we just created a layer mask. So this is the same thing. We just refer to it in the script. And we're just going to call this ground layer. Now that we have all of that set up, we can get back to the player. And over here, sorry, that's a script error. We're just going to return true for now. So over here, we can take in a transform, which is the positional data of a game object. Mm -hmm. So where should this be? This should be ground check, such that we know that it is this point that we want its position to be checked. Is this on the ground? And what is the ground? The ground is the ground layer. So now that we have all of that set up, we can get back here and do what we want to do. So this will return physics to the overlap circle. It takes in a point. So what is this point supposed to be? So this point would be this uh, ground track. It also needs a radius, like how large would this circle check be? So overlap circle is like very intuitively, this point here, right? We have an extra circle outside of it. So it's going to check if it intersects with the ground layer in this extra outside circle. So how large do we want the circle radius? We probably don't want it to be too large because else we can be like off the ground, but it's still going to detect us on the ground. But it cannot be zero as well because zero means that it's not intersecting anyways. So we're just going to give this a very small value like, I don't know, 0 0.04 sounds like a good idea. And you want to add an F because this is a floating point number. But we're still missing something. We're still missing something. That's the layer mask. So we're just going to take this in. Oh, because this is a transform, we need to say that it's the position of this class. Okay? Is everyone following? So essentially what this does is it will check for the position of the ground check position. And if this ground check is within a radius of 0 0.04 and it touches with the ground layer, this entire thing, this entire method returns true. If else it returns false. So now we have this. We just need to add this to the conditional statement. If the jump button is pressed and we are grounded, we can jump. So now that we get back here, we can jump and we are not flying. You can see that I'm holding down space 
but I'm not consistently going up, which means this works. But there's a problem. Actually, there's, there's a problem. And the problem is the ball rotates as I go. So if you look at the ground check over in this scene editor, it went here. And as we move, the position changes. So we don't want this to change. We probably do not want this player object to rotate. So what we can do is uh, we just need to go to the player. On rigid body 2D constraints, we can freeze the rotation such that this object never rotates at any given point. So we can click on play again. And you can see that this ground check always stays on the floor, right? It does not change location, which means I can move anywhere that I want. And I can jump and I can move. So we're making progress. But at this point, you would be asking yourself, circle looks bland. Why can't I use anything else? Like, give me an actual player. I don't want to just look at a circle all day playing my platform game. That's not fair. Okay. You play Super Mario, there's at least a mascot there. So, introducing the Unity Asset Store. I know most of us here is probably not an artist. So, you cannot draw to save your, save your eyes. But on Unity Asset Store, you can get free or paid assets. You can get art assets, sound effects, BGM, libraries, anything, okay? And assets that you have bought will sync automatically to your Unity account. So if you spend $10 buying this, you change your PC, doesn't matter. You can just bring that over to your new PC because it's saved to your Unity account. And then you can import any asset that you got with the package manager. So we're going to go through that very quickly. So you can find the Unity Asset Store just on Google. It's just called Unity Asset Store. And once you get inside, you can see that there's a bunch of stuff here. There are 46,000 libraries on 3D and a bunch of stuff over here. Look at, look at all this amazing stuff that all the artists of Unity has, has done. Like you can have like this paid asset that have realistic roads that you can use in the future. Maybe you want to make a game about roads. I don't know, right? So that's a bunch of stuff you can get here, right? And the cool thing is most of the stuff that you can get, even if it's a free asset on Unity asset store, they can be used commercially, which means you can publish this game that you have created with asset packs that you have downloaded from Unity Asset Store onto Play Store, monetize it $1, no problem. You can get that money. That's the cool part, okay? So you don't have to be an artist to make a game in Unity. Well, if you are satisfied with these kinds of art that the artists on Unity Asset Store can give you. So for the purpose of this um, project, I'm just going to be using one of these because it has, well, most of the stuff that we need. It has a player, right? it has a ground and all those kinds of things. We're probably not going to need a lot. So you can look up for this simple 2D platform asset pack over on here and it's just going to come out and you just click on it and over here it should be get or something if you haven't owned it yet but I already have so it's open at Unity for me so what you need to do now once you've gotten this asset is to make sure that your Unity Hub is signed into the same account right so it's signed into the same account for you now that once you get back to Unity Editor, you can click on Window, Package Manager. And over here are all the packages that you can use. 
And what you want to do is to change this packages in project to my assets. And it's going to fetch all the assets that you own on your Unity account. Once that is done that, you can see that all the accounts, all the asset packs that you have, libraries that you have, is over here. And this is the one that we're going to be using. So what you need to do is to just click on import and just click on install, whatever. And it's just going to download this. It's just going to download this. And now this asset pack is free for use. There are all the arts that it has. So over here, everything is in this simple 2D platform or BA2 folder, which is just the name of the asset pack actually. So sprites are what we call like the art objects for 2D game objects. So we call them sprites because I don't know, it sounds cool. Okay. So over here we have a player. So you can just use this. You can see that they have created multiple variants of the player and they've labeled it. And those are for animations. Uh, we are probably not going to touch that today because of time concerns. We're going to see if we have enough time uh, when we end this workshop. So. How do you use a custom asset? Well, you just need to drag and drop. That's it, that's simple. And this player object is now inside of your game. So now we want to make sure that this game object here, get away, is properly configured. You can see that it's already here, it's in a screen. So first we rename it as player. Second, we want to add the rigid body to the uh, component. Never forget a collider. So notice that this time it's not a circle. So we want to use another collider that fits it. And in this case, it looks like a square. So we're just going to use a box collider. But once you select that, this green part here, this green box, is the size of the collider. You don't want to go through an issue where the people that plays your game be like, what is this bullshit hitbox? I'm not even at the wall and I'm hitting the wall. I can't move forward. So you want to make sure that this hitbox fits this player art as well as possible. And you can do that by clicking on this tree dot on the edit collider. Now you can change the size of this collider, how it fits. Now you just need to drag this inside and now this collider is good to go. Save that. And we're also going to need to add the movement script. So we are just going to add the player movement script to this. Give it a speed. Give it a jump speed. We're also going to need the player, like the ground check. So we're just also going to create an empty. Ground check. Change the name. And of course, also move this. Notice that all the child objects of the parent object is actually referencing to the parent object. So the position of negative y equals 0 0.5 here is actually relative to the parent object's location position. So if the parent object moves, this thing always stays at negative 0 0.5 of the parent object. But that is um, probably useful in the future, but you should know that it's relative to the parent object. So now that we have that, let's add that back in. Let's make sure that it's ground. And we can play. Now we have a working player. But it faces only one direction. So we want to flip it in a sense, right? We want to make sure that it changes. So in order to do that, so in order to do that, we need to first have like a way for us to track 
which direction we're looking at. So for example, if I'm moving to the right and I'm facing to the left, then I should flip such that I'm walking to the right, such that I'm facing the right. Con uh, vice versa, if I'm moving to the left, but I am facing the right, I should flip such that I look to the left. Intuitively, that's how we walk, right? So you can move forward. And then when you want to walk backwards, you're going to turn your entire body over, which means we need to have a way for this, uh, for, for this script to know where I'm facing. So we can just do like a Boolean. Oh, is right. It crashed. It's fine. Unity shenanigans. So when we are facing the right, this is right should be true. And it's always facing the right when we start the game, right? It's always facing right side. So we can just do is right is true here. So when this object spawns, it knows that it is facing to the right. But we want to change this. So we need to check such that if we are moving to the left, which is when horizontal move is smaller than zero, and we are facing the right, we want to flip. So let's just ride like uh, something that allows us to flip. So we can do something like um, player uh, transform dot scale, local scale. So this transform, as I mentioned, is the positional data and the rotational data of the game object. So inside of transform, we can check the inspector. They are scale. So if we change this X scale to negative, you see it flips over. So we want to do that through the script, but we do not want it to like elongate. Like it shouldn't look wide, it shouldn't look flat, fat, okay? So the player should look like just the player, how we want it to. So we can just do a new vector tree. So what we need to do is to just make the x to be its own negative so when it's one it looks like this if it's negative one it looks just exactly the same but it's flipped so we flip it back we flip it again is this motion that we want so we can just do we just flip the x we multiply it by a negative one and then we keep the y and x scale A y and z scale, such that it doesn't change its height or it doesn't change its. And the z is kind of useless in 2D, but that's there, so we need to use it. So aside from that, when we're moving to the left, we are no longer facing the right. So we should do is right equals false. Please. Okay, what else? We need to do this in the opposite direction. So else if horizontal move is greater than zero and we are not facing right, we want to do the same thing. So we can just copy paste, but this time, we're going to set this true. So every frame is going to check whether or not we're on, we're going to the left and is facing right, or we're going to the right and we're facing left to check whether or not we are supposed to flip. So let's see if this works. So we're going to just play. There we have it. Now it looks good, but is there a way for us to streamline this code? 
if you want to write a good code, then you probably want to use an additional method to do that. We're going to call that flip. And we just copy this over. And notice that it's just going to go from false to true. So we can just do that. Sorry. So we can just do that. So every time if is right is true, we call a flip, it's gonna be false. And this is always going to be the case because we always start facing right, facing the same direction. So when we go to the left, it's gonna it's, o it's only going to call a flip when we go to the left the first time. Then it's going to be false. Then it's only going to flip when we go to right afterwards. Then is right becomes true again. So the invariant is this is always correct. So is right is always going to be the directional data. Is always going to be the direction that the player is moving in. So we can do that. And we can do that. So now we are like, what? We don't have to look at a bunch of code and update anymore. Now we can click on play and we can see that it still works exactly the way that we wanted to. Well, that's good. That's cool. But at this point of time, you have already taken care of the aesthetic of the player and you're going to tell me platforms look boring. I'm not going to look at a white circle, like a white rectangle at this point. I don't want that. I want to have actual Super Mario looking platforms. Right. So what can we do? Introducing Talman. So notice that how all of these are like separate PNGs or whatever, separate image files that you drag in is just one unit. Which means if I want to make a huge level, I'm going to drag in tens of thousands of this block. That's too troublesome. I don't want to do that. I can spend like 10 hours doing a level and I'm only halfway there. That is not practical. So Unity provided us with a tool called Palmap. Essentially, it's like painting in Photoshop or MS Paint, but instead of painting with pixels and single colors, you can paint with these PNG files. So it's like a toolbrush. It allows us to create 2D levels faster and more efficiently. And that's how we want to do it. We want to focus on design. We don't want to spend 20 hours making a level because we are dragging and dropping 10,000 PNG files into the game scene. That is not what we want to do. So what we can do is first, we want to open up a window to the tile palette. So what is a tile palette? The tile palette is essentially a color scheme. It's like the RGB value in Photoshop, right? Or in MS Paint, you tell it what color you're gonna use. You're gonna need a color palette. But here, since we're painting with tiles, we're gonna need a tile palette. So we're just gonna drag and we're just going to first create a new folder. We're gonna call it I don't know, sprites, because this is where all the arts are. And we can just create a 2D help palette, rectangular help palette. We're gonna call this ground. Now that we have that, we can get back to where we got the asset pack and just drag and drop this entire thing over. And it's going to do this. It doesn't matter, we just save it. Save it to the sprites folder. Now, when you go to the sprite folder, we can see that we have a pal palette. So we can now select it, but we still can't paint. And that's because we have not given it a towel to paint. So it's like, if you're trying to draw something digitally, you're, gonna, you're going to need a canvas, but you don't have a canvas. So you need to create a canvas. You just go to here, 
create a 2D object, a tile map, and a rectangular tile map. We're just going to call this ground. Now, notice when I select one of these blocks, I can hover over the scene editor. And I can just directly paint it on. And that's there. Which means I can do something like this. Cool. So I don't have to spend 20 hours drag and dropping all of these singular images. I can just paint them on. How cool is that? So this is how you can create 2D levels as efficiently as possible. You just need a tile palette, a tile map, just paint it on. Okay, You don't have to give a shit about spending 50 hours trying to drag and drop. That's not going to happen. Unity got you covered. So now that we have that, this boring ass thing can go away. But as usual, we are going to add the properties back. So first, we have a rigid body that will have to be a static rigid body. Next up, we need a collider. And Unity's got you covered. Because if we use a box collider, this means that the edges that there are no ground, for example, here, is also going to be covered in collider. Because a box collider only has four edges. If it has to fit to the entire tile map, this means that all the points, if we pull it up, then the fourth point would obviously be higher than here. Right? That makes geometrical sense. So to in order to help us with that, there's something called the tile map collider. And notice it's just going to cover all the tiles with its own individual collider. And that's it. Now we can play. Oh, sorry, we are stuck. Because of course I did not account that the player should spawn higher. So you can just directly paint on it. Right, if you want to replace it, you can just do that. So now we have that. Let's uh, play. And I can move left and right. But I cannot jump because I forgot to give this ground a layer. Now that we have that, we should be able to jump, no problem. Yeah, it works. Oh, what is that? I just did an acrobat. That's not supposed to happen. So what actually happened is a problem with the tile map client. Notice how between each tile, it's like its own individual box collider. We don't want that. Like the player actually got stuck between these two pixels and do an acrobat because it collided with this one thing here. It collided with that one thing here and the physics engine freaks out and it just gives it a spin. We don't want that to happen. So we can just use a composite collider. What the composite collider does is it takes in all the colliders for this game object, merges them into one single large collider that is of the same shape, of the same size as the original collider. So notice how right now it's, you know, like there's a green line here. We don't want that. So you can just click on use by composite. Gone. Now it's one single large collider for the entire ground, and we will not do acrobats ever again. So that's cool. So now you can move around. Notice we don't flip over anymore. That's what we want. We don't want the player to suddenly freak out and just flip over, and we can't jump anymore because it's upside down. It's not on the ground. So that's not what we wanted. So now that we have all of that covered, how do we finish the game? So before we head on to that point, I think we are supposed to get a small refreshment. Right? Refreshment. 
Is it here? So we are going to postpone that a bit. Uh, before that, does anyone have any questions or like are these very Yes, until this point. Okay. Okay. Any questions up until this point? So, what we are going to do next is uh, the next phase of game development. So, if there's any questions you have up until this movement point, you should point it out. I see it's so loud. Thank you. 
¿Qué <laughs> Oh, 
I mean, oh, 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 I'm going to shift it. Is this? Wait. Overlap cycle. Uh? Yeah. This is the overlap cycle. This is the overlap cycle. Right, so it's not separate. No. So how are you implementing each grounded? You check every. You just check every update to see a point on the player yeah. where you know when it touches the ground, the player's. Uh -huh. To see if it overlaps with the ground. What are the references? This is 2D the overlap cycle returns our. Uh, returns a boolean value. Is is it a boolean? It's a list of colliders. Mm -hmm. I think it's a boolean value. Is it a boolean value? I think it's a boolean value. Yes, it, it is a boolean value. Oh, so you have a point. So it's a collider. Check. So it's a collider. You have a point called ground check. Yeah. yeah. Then what's ground layer? Ground layer is the layer of the ground. It's the layer mass. So it's like telling Unity to know that this is the ground. Have you taught them that already? Yeah. Okay, then a bunch of them don't know. So I'll just leave it here. Then tell them. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, I think some of them might not have been able to copy the code fast enough. So just now the one of the girls told me to scroll down also. I see. She, yeah. Then she had like 20 compile errors because she copied halfway. <laughs> yeah. Three then weeks in two hours. Yes, exactly. Compression. compression. Humongous yeah. compression. If I don't type this quickly, I'm not gonna finish it. Oh you type it all in front. I type it all in front. Yes, you can practice. Uh. I can practice. <laughs> Overall, just now I heard the presentation voice projection. Okay, so we took like a 15 minutes break. The refreshment is not here yet. We don't know where it went, but that's fine. We can just have it after the workout. <laughs> so we're going to move into phase two, which is on play interactions. And essentially is how you actually have the mechanics to play the game. So like we mentioned, in a platformer, you probably want to have obstacles. To end the game, you probably want a finish line. And to motivate the player to actually play the game, you probably need like a reward system. So something you can collect on the way. Like in Super Mario, you have things like star points. You want to have those kinds of reward system. So this is where the, uh, the next part of the game development process comes. How do we finish the game? We're going to use something called tags. So this tag is a property on the game object that is very similar to a layer mask, but it's different. Because a layer mask allows us to do physics abstraction, but a tag allows us to do game object abstraction. So it separates only the game object from each other, and we can filter a game object for required op operations. And the most important thing is that each game object only has one tag. It can only be tagged once. So for example, if you tag the player as a player, you cannot tag the player as the finish line. That's not possible. 
Okay, Unity only allows one tag per game object. So how do we do this? We just go back to the game editor, the Unity editor. So first of all, we need to have a finish line. That's where we're going to finish the game. So we can just go to sprites and notice in this asset pack that we have, there's a finish line. So what we can do is we just drag and drop this finish line to the end. So in order to kind of like, first of all, we need to have a tag, right? To interact with this game of drag. Unity already has some built into us. So we just use it. And this is called finish. So now that the game engine knows that this is the finish line, this is the object that labels the finish line for us. That's what we need to know. But aside from that, we also need to make it such that we can interact with it. So we are going to add a collider. But what's different is this time, we don't want to collide into the flag. As in, I don't want to just bump into it like I bump into a table, I stop. I don't want that. I probably want to be able to move over the finish line. Right, does that make sense? Like when you go to Mario, you don't just bump into the finish line, you walk across it, walk past it. So in order to do that, we would make this collider a trigger. So let me show you what's the difference. So when we are on a normal collider, oh, I just noticed that it is outside. So a quick way that you can let the camera follow the player is you just make the camera a child object of the player. Remember when I said that all child objects positional data is relative to the parent object. So if we make this main camera as a child object of the player, that means when the player moves, the camera moves with the player. Okay. So this is when we have a collider. We just bump into it. We can't do anything to it, right? We just stop. We can't do anything. To it. But when we want, when we make it a trigger, we no longer collide with it. It's as if the collider does not exist. We can move through it. But what does that help us? The thing is, every single time, when you move into a collider in Unity, it, trig it invokes an event. So the engine knows that you actually go into the collider. But the difference is if it is a normal collider where it does not allow objects to pass through, it invokes an on collision enter event. But for a trigger that we can pass through, it invokes an on trigger enter event. This is useful for abstraction and when you need interactions for different, for different game objects that has different properties. So now that we know that, we want to make sure that we actually have a way to use it. So we're just gonna create a new script. We're gonna call this player interaction. So this is how the player would interact. This is the code that determines how the player interact with all the different game objects in the game. So I can open it up. Realistically, we do not need any of this anymore. Because as I mentioned, when you bump into a collider, Unity will automatically invoke an event, which means these things are useless. We just need to know what event it invokes. So when we are walking into a trigger, it, it uh, invokes on trigger enter 2D because this is a 2D game. So it's a 2D method, okay? So notice that it has a collider 2D collision. That's not important. This collider 2D here is uh, the collider of the object that you bump into. So if the player bumps into the finish line, 
then this collision would be the collider of the finish line. Okay, that's make, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. So essentially what we need to do is we need to check the tag of the game object that we bumped into. Okay, is that the finish line that we want? So this could be a conditional statement, but for better practices, when you're trying to scale the game to have tens of hundreds of different interactions that you can do, you'll probably want to use a switch case. So collision.tag. The tag is the tag of the game object. So if we bump into the finish line, it's going to get the tag of the finish line, which is finish. So essentially what we need to do is to just case finish, which means if the case, if the tag is finish, we just need to finish the game, but we don't know how to finish the game yet. So we just need to make sure that this interaction works. For now, we can just use debug.log, which is going to print something onto the console to know that this is working. So what can we do? We can just debug the log, something like game finished uh, or level cleared. And we need to break out of this statement, have a default that breaks, that's it. So now that we have this conditional statement, we can go back to this uh, editor, go to player, and we just need to add this script to it. Now, when we play the game, when we walk into this finish line, it prints level clear. And it will print every single time I walk into it. Cool. So we know that this works. Right. But we actually need to finish the game though. So we probably want to go to a new level, right? So in order to do that, we're going to use something called the scene manager. This is a tool Unity provided that allows us to transition between scenes, load different scenes, right? So you can move from this one scene that you currently have to a new scene that you have created all with this scene manager class. But that's one point. The catch is all scenes that you want to load are required to be in the build settings. So I'm going to quickly guide you through what that means. First of all, we need a new scene. So we're just going to create a new scene. Just go to the scenes folder and create scene. Call it whatever you want. Okay, I'm just going to call it level two. Now you can see that when you double click on level two, it goes to the scene of level two. It's completely blank here. You can change this however you want, like how you have edited your first scene. Okay, so you can create a new level here. So in order to access this level in the game, you want to click on file and build settings. Look at this, scenes in build. This means these scenes are available in the final product. And we're going to need to have to add this level two that we have just created by drag and drop through this to make it such that Unity knows that we want this scene to be here and such that we can actually change to this scene. So now that we have that set up, it's time to write the code for it. So we want the scene manager class you need to use the scene management namespace to do that. Okay, so you want a scene manager class. So we want this to load a scene. So it's literally called load scene. Notice it takes in a built index. So this built index is available in this build settings, right? It's here. This is index zero, this is index one. But when you're making a game that goes continuously, you probably do not want to hard code that, right? 
because you're going to have hundreds of stage and that means you're going to have hundreds of i don't know hundreds of interaction code that's not plausible so we just need to make it low to the next level so what we need to do is to just do scene manager dot get active scene dot build index so this will get the build index of the current scene that is running now to load the next scene mathematically you just add one that's all we need to do this means that every time we reach a finish line is going to automatically load the next scene that is in the game settings in the build settings so let's see if that works let's go back to sample scene by double clicking on it we went to level two you can see that it is level two now there's nothing here because i added nothing but that's progress that means we have a way to either end the game or we have a way to actually like proceed to the next level when you're trying to build more. So that's cool. Now that we have a way to finish a game, we're still lacking some things. We don't have obstacles, right? We don't have a reward system. So we want to add those in. And that's simple because all you have to do is to do about the same thing. You just get to Sprite, find what you want as obstacle. This one has a spike, so I'm just going to use this spike as an obstacle. Let's drag and drop into the game scene. This time, we just need to change the tag. We don't want, so we want every single time you want to have game object interactions, the first thing you have to come to mind is I probably need a new tag so that we have a unique interaction for this game object. So we can just add a new tag. Well, Unity has a built-in one. It's called respawn. That's exactly what we want to do. When we step on the spike, we want to respawn. So we can just do that. And add that case to our interaction. So when we respawn, what do we want to do? When we respawn, the first thing we want to do is of course we want to reload the scene so it's as if the scene restarted so for example if you die in like the chrome the chrome dino game right just start from the beginning everything resets you know that kind of feeling so what you need to do is to just reload the active scene so it's just going to restart everything from scratch So that's it that's all we need to do so in order to make sure that this works we're still missing one thing we don't have a collider so the game doesn't know that we are actually moving into uh, an object with the respawn tag so you just need to add an interaction and uh, we're just going to add a collider but this is a triangle there is no triangle collider here but there's something that works the same. It's called the Polygon Collider. So you can just click on that. And then Unity is going to try its best to fit this collider to the size of, to the shape of it. But obviously that does not fit. So I'm just going to edit Collider and just change this. So now it looks much better. It fits much better. So now let's save that. And we also want to make sure that this is a trigger. Because if not, we cannot invoke the on trigger enter to the event. So we're going to make sure that this is a trigger. Now, when we play, we respawn. Right. Now you can jump over it and you finish. So everything works as intended, of course. What else do we need? We're still lacking something to make this like a full-fledged 2D platformer. We're lacking coins. It doesn't look exciting enough for us to play. 
when you're designing a game, you probably want something that rewards the player for doing it. So in any kind of platformer games, the easiest way is to give the player some coins, give them a way to track their high score. So we can do that by adding a coin. Well, there's a coin here. So we just drag and drop to the game scene. Now we just repeat the same process, but this time when we look at here, there are no tags that we want. There's no tag called score. There's no tag called like points. So we want to add our own tag. We can just do that by clicking add tag. You can add, I'm pretty sure there's about 256 tags or something, but that's not important. You're probably never going to use them all. So you just add a new tag and we're just going to give it a name called coin. Now that I have that, we got back here, we can change this and add the coins tag to it. Now the process is just the same. We add a collider to this and we're going to edit the size because this is too large. Okay, we want to make it fit the coin. And we've done that. So we are going to click on is trigger such that this is a trigger. And all we need to do is to create a new case points. So this coin case is going to increase our score. So we still gonna need something that can store our score. So we know what our current score is. So we just need to add a new field. Hello? Oh, sorry. It's not supposed to be there. So we're just going to add a new integer, private int, because the score is not going to be like a float value. We don't need decimal points. It's just whole number, it's 0, 1, 2, 3, right? So we can just use an integer and we're going to call it, what are we going to call it? Uh, we're just going to call it score. And we're going to initialize it as zero because you start with zero score, of course. So when we get the coin, we want to increase the score. And we probably also want to know if this works. So we're just going to debug the log. We're just going to print our current score out. So we can just some, say something like coins collected. Current score is. And concatenate the score into it. So this should print our current score. Let's see if this works. Oh. It works. We picked up the coin and our current score is one, but the coin is still there. That's not supposed to happen. You're supposed, the coin is supposed to just disappear after I pick it up, right? Like, but why is this happening? So the way we can fix this is by destroying the coin after we pick it up. So this works because once you destroy it from the game scene, it does not exist anymore. But because the scenes still kind of have that information, so every time you load back the scene, the coin will still be there. So this is the most naive way you can do this, but it's of course the most beginner friendly way. So you can just destroy collision dot game object. So this would call destroy. It will destroy the game object of this collider that we've just bumped into. Okay, so let's see if this works. It's gone. And notice that every single time we respawn or we restart the stage, this coin comes back. So there's no implications to what we want to do. Uh, there's, there are no implications on what we want to do. Of course, if you want to have your own idea that the coin stays, you know, 
maybe you don't want to reload the scene at all. But that is, of course, up to your own imagination. So for the purpose of this workshop, we're just going to do this. But at this point, you're asking yourself, one coin is not enough, right? You'll probably need hundreds of coins. Does that mean I have to drag each coin once and then add a tag, add a collider, you know, and then change the size of the collider? That is troublesome work, but Unity's got you covered. You don't need to do that. So, introducing Prefab. So Prefab allows us to reuse game objects that has the same property. So if you create a prefab of a coin, that means that you can just reuse the coin that already has all of its properties and all of its components correctly configured. So it will have all the tags, it will have all the collider size, the collider is a trigger and all those kinds of things. This helps with your game development process because you don't have to do all those kinds of mundane things hundreds of times over. And the cool thing about this is any game object can be made into a prefab. And any changes to the prefab object changes all game objects use. So which means all of the instances of the prefab object in the game scene, across all the scenes, if you change something in the prefab, all of those are going to get changed. And let's... Let's demonstrate that. So for best practices, you just need to create a new folder. We are going to call that prefab. Get into this folder. Just drag and drop the coins to it, and that's it. That is a prefab. Notice how now that this is kind of blue, this means that this is a prefab object. So now you can drag and drop this coin object, this prefab, and it's already correctly configured. It has the tag coins, and then it has a collider that is fitting to its size, and we also have it being a trigger. That's good. So essentially, when you change this prefab, you can double click on it to get its properties. When you change this prefab, anything that is different from this position and this rotational data will all get applied to all of the prefab instances in the game. So for example, if I turn off this to make it not a trigger, when we get back here, we can select them. And these are all not the trigger anymore, which means you can kind of like change everything at once. For example, if you suddenly feel like the coin Ha needs to have something else, you can just change the prefab and every single coin gets changed. You don't have to go through all the 500 instances that you have on the coins to make all of these changes. Not required. You just change the prefab. So let's change that back. Notice how these are all back to being a trigger. That's cool. So as I said, you can make every single object a prefab. So you can just drag and drop your finish, your spike, your player, and you can reuse them across all scenes that you have in this project. So you can just put more spikes. Maybe you want more spikes. Put more players, but there's no point. Okay, put more finish lines. Use finish lines in a different game scene. That's all that you can do. So that is cool and all, right? So you can just add more coins, you know, like as many as you want. And all of them would have the same properties as the first coin that you have created as the prefab. So that is essentially it. Okay. Yeah, that is almost essentially it. But we still lack a few points, right? Right now, in order to track the score, we have to look at the console. But as all developers know, all programmers know, this thing is not gonna be in your final program. Like you can't just open up Chrome. Actually, there is in a browser, but you can't just open up Chrome 
and that's a compilation error on Chrome, and there's a console there. That's not gonna happen. You don't see a console on the finished product. So we wanna have a way to show this to the player of how much their scores are. So how can we do that? We're gonna use a user interface, a UI. So you can just right click here, go to UI. We're just gonna use a legacy text because that's all we're gonna need. And we're gonna call this score. So notice that when you zoom out, there is a new text here. And you can move this and you see that it's over in the game scene. The reason why it looks a bit off centered is because the canvas of this UI is not properly configured. So in order to scale to different screen sizes, right now you have, you know, laptops with 1920 by 1080p screen. You have MacBooks that run on something like 2500 by, you know, 1440p kind of things. You know, you have people that is rich, buy a 4K monitor, all these kinds of resolutions that are different. So you want to cater to them. So you want to make sure that your game works on devices with different resolutions. All you have to do is to change this UI scale mode to scale with screen size and give it a reference resolution. Generally, the reference resolution is what the game is natively supposed to run at. And therefore, by today's standard, we can just do 1920 by 1080, which is the general most popular resolution right now. So now we can click on the score again and notice that it's here, it's small, we can't see it. So we can just increase the text size, the font size. Let's give it some large numbers, give it 80 maybe. But because this is too large, it cannot show in the text box, so it's not showing. So we also need to position, we also need to change the width and height of the text box. Now that's better. So we can also change it in this tool mode here. And we can move it around. Make sure that it's on the top right corner of the screen. And we can then, you know, change it. Change its uh, text. So now that we have a tracker, how do we change it dynamically? So the one thing about game development at this point, you guys probably have caught up is if you want to change something in the script, you need to refer to that thing in the script. So what we need to do is to go back to this play interaction where this score is being tracked. We just need to add a new field called text. It's in the Unity Engine.ui namespace. So private text, we're going to call this score text. And essentially, when we get here, we want to change the score text to the current score. So we can do score text dot text equals score and concatenate score to it. That's it. So every single time we take a new coin, this thing triggers, our score increases, and our score text dot text, which is the text of the score text component, increases, it changes to what the current score is. So let's get back here and let's go to player. Now you can drag and drop the score text into this. Now when we play, score is zero. Right, that's good. The score changes, that's cool. So now we have a fully working game. There's a reward system, there are obstacles, there's a way that we can end the game. But it still feels like something is lacking. We are still needing something that makes this an actual game. Can anyone guess what it is? 
Sound? No. We're not going to touch into sound today. Menu? Yes, we are lacking a user interface that we can interact with. So how can we do that? We're probably going to just need a basic start menu and an end screen. So it's not going to be too complicated. So we're just going to go to scenes. We're going to create a new scene. Create scene. And we're just going to call this start. Cool. So what should we have in the menu? We need to have a button that we can press on that lets us start the game and a button we can press on that lets us exit the game. Right, that makes sense. Like that is in absolutely every single menu in any game that you have out there. So what we can do is to just add a UI, add a button, legacy button. We're gonna call this a start game, actually start button. And we're just gonna create another UI component which is also a button, we're going to call that an exit game, exit button. So now we're also going to do the same thing. Make sure that every single time you create a new UI component, you need to change the canvas such that it fits for all resolutions out there. This is, well, best practices, of course. Now that you've done that, you just need to position this a bit. Uh, let's change the Y position for the start button to be somewhere higher, like 80, and change the one for the exit button to negative 80 so that it's symmetrical. Then we can change the width and height of this. Let's just make it, I don't know, 320 by 100 maybe. Oh, that, that looks good. Now, inside of a button component, we actually have a text. So this text would be, whatever the button is displaying. So we can just change that. So for the start button, we're just gonna call this start game. Put an exclamation mark so that it looks better and increase the font size. Uh, the font size is too large. Okay, 40 looks good. The exit button is the same. You can click on this and we're just gonna do exit game. And we're just gonna change this as well. Cool. So now that we have that, does that work? Well, at this point, you should know that, of course, it doesn't work because we don't have a way for the engine to know that we need this to do something. So we're going to add a script. But um, we know that scripts are supposed to be attached to a game object. So what we're going to do is we're going to make an empty object here. We're going to call this the start manager. So this object will contain the script that contains the information on what we should do when these buttons are being clicked. So now that we have this game object, we're going to go to script and create a new script called start manager. So these are unimportant because you only need the buttons to do what they need to do. So we're just gonna add a public method. So a public void method, we're gonna call this start game. Important, do not call this start or else Unity will think that this is the start method for every single game object script out there. So you have to use a different name. We're just gonna call the start game. So what the start game does is it loads the first scene. So we just need to load scene, right? And because we only load the same scene for start game, which is you know, the first level of the game. So all we need to do is to just scene manager.load scene give that a build ID, which is the first scene. That's cool. Now the next thing we need to do is of course have an exit game method. 
So when we click on the exit game button, it will close the game. All you have to do is to do call application.quit. So this is what Unity gives us that allows us to just leave the game. So you click on it, it calls application.quit, then the game quits itself. So you just get back to the home screen. That's cool. But in the preview mode, we cannot do that. So for testing purposes, again, we're going to print something. So we can just do that. Cool. Now that we have that, let's get back here. And we are going to drag this in to the start manager. Now this has a script. Now for the buttons, we also have to refer to the start manager. So this onClick method will be invoked when we click on the button. Like intuitively, that's what it's supposed to do. So I want to add a new action to it. So every single time we click on it, it's going to call start manager. The script of the start manager to run the start game method. So we're going to do the same for the exit button. So when it's clicked, it will call the start manager. And it's going to call the exit game method. So essentially, that's all we need to do. And to demonstrate that it works, let's just play the scene. We can first click on exit game. And we can see that the console prints quitting game. This means this method works. When you click on start game, it loads us to an empty scene because this is level two. Level two is the build index one in our current game, which means we have to change that. We don't want level two to be loaded. We want the, the level that has something in it, right? So all we need to do is to just go to build settings, remove level two, get the start level into it, and push that to be scene zero. You just drag and drop and just drag and drop again. Cool. Now we play the game. Click on start game. We load to the first level. How cool is that? But scene with built index two cannot be found because in our current build settings, there is no scene with built index two. So what should we do about that? Well, we can just make an end screen. And because the end screen is just going to be the same as the start screen, as a lazy developer, we're just going to copy and paste it. So it duplicates this current scene. And we're just going to rename it. But of course, we're going to change it a bit because when you finish the game, you probably want to ask them to play again instead. So we're just going to change that. So that's entirely the same scene with entirely the same code that does entirely the same thing that we wanted to do. So we can just go back to build settings and we can just add that in. So now when we go to the start screen, we play, press, we press play. Exit game works. It prints quitting game in the console. Start game works. The exit game here works. With creating game, we can play again. And it works too. So at this point, this game is functional. So what's the last thing we do? What is the last thing we do? We build the game. After you finish building the game, you can send your game to your friends to play it. You can upload it to some websites like itch.io so that others can also download and play the game. So how do you build it? Well, we just need to save it, make sure everything is saved. Go to File, Build Settings. Again, here you can select all the platforms that you want to publish to. Notice we have Windows, Mac OS. You know, you can publish to 64-bit and 32-bits too. You know, you can publish it to a server, but it's not installed for me. You can publish it to WebGL such that it becomes like a game that you can run on a web engine. You can run on a browser. You know, you can publish it to PS, iOS, TVOS, Android. 
all those kinds of things. But of course, you would need to install the modules. And for PS4, PS5, you know, consoles uh, publishing, you also need to subscribe to Unity's paid plan. Well, that's not the point today. We're just building for Windows because I use a Windows PC. So you can just click on build, select wherever you want is built. So I'm just gonna build this somewhere. I'm gonna call this a new folder, Unity Hacker Workshop. Select this folder to build to. This is gonna take a while. Um, generally for a fast enough PC, it takes less than a minute. Oh, there are some built exceptions. Huh. That is interesting. Oh, why is this here? Okay, that is um unexpected. So we're just gonna publish it again. Okay. Now that it's reached this point, this means that it's about to be done. So let's just wait for it for a while. And uh, yeah, it's built. Look, look at it, it's succeeded. So now we can get to here and notice there are a couple of files. If you have messed with Unity, games before you would have seen the exact same folder structure i'm not going to go through that but what's important is this this is the game we have just built i can double click on it to run it it's made with unity it has the exact same ui we want start game it's everything we wanted to have we can die right Finish the game, we can play again, and we can exit the game. So that is it. That is all to game development. The basics are there, and all you have to do is to be creative, right? Everything you need to do is going to just be whatever that has been taught here today. Of course, things like animations and sounds, it's regrettable that. We cannot get into it due to time concerns. If we have like an extra hour and a half, we could have finished that, but we don't. So in this two hour workshop, we went through most of the basics for game development, how to use the Unity engine and how you could use the tools built into Unity engine to facilitate with your game development process. All you have to do now is to spend maybe another 100 hours to sit on a project and start making what you want to do. Have an idea, prototype it, try to make it work, expand it, make more levels. And that's basically just it. If you have, you know, so yeah, that's all. That is all that we have to learn for Unity Beginners Workshop. So, this is the feedback form, and the hackers would, of course, appreciate it if you could scan and give some feedback for this uh, workshop. If there's anything that we could improve on in the future, for future workshops, of course, if there's actually a chance. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the feedback form is over there. You can just click on it. Uh, if you would like to learn more about game development, feel free to join our Discord or Telegram group, uh, NUS GDG. We also have uh, sessions every week. So this week we also have a session, but this week's session is a game night. So we're uh, just going to go there and play Gartic Phone and Butter uh, Jujaba. So if you want to come, also can. But yeah, if you want to join a group of game developers, yeah, sure. community of game yeah. developers, uh, do take a look at NUSD. Do you want to share your link? Oh, link.
a link? Uh, do I have a link? We do, but um, you show the Discord. Go to your Discord. Then. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, if you go to NUS Sync, you should be able to find NUS Games Development Group, and then uh, you should can join Discord here. So, uh, what we have is we have um to share a little bit more about CCA. Uh, during Sam one will be catered towards beginners. And because this semester, this year was the first time we, our club was so active, so next year I'm also doing an advanced game development workshop during Sam 1. Sam 2, uh, the second of Sam 2, uh, the second of Sam 1 will be um, you breaking out into different groups and creating your own game for the rest of the semester. And Sam 2 will be more on intricate game development stuff. So that's like state machines, um, the different stuff that makes a game function. So yeah, if you're interested in it, oh, there's also multiplayer workshop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you're interested in getting around, please draw out CCA. Yes, and I hope to see you there. I need to stop the recording. All right, yeah, you can stop the recording. Okay, okay hi guys.